you would turn with me in your New Testaments to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, we'll be studying from the text there and making some application this morning. It's wonderful to be with you, and I hope you're drying off and can be focused on the Word of God with me in this hour of worship. We're to be strong and courageous, and the fact that God has redeemed us and made us a part of His family is everything we need to find strength and courage to battle against the most daunting and powerful foe we have, Satan himself. Be strong and courageous. You know, the power that we talk about is going to be joined with great wealth when we find that victory in Christ. And you see that theme throughout the Bible and prophecy in the Old Testament and in realization and anticipation of the New Testament in Christ. Power and wealth. All the power and all the wealth concerning spiritual things are found in Christ Jesus. And what that necessarily means is that outside of Christ Jesus, there is no power and there is no wealth. It is exclusively in Christ Jesus Christians are those who have tasted that the Lord is gracious. 1 Peter 2 and verse 3 says, If you've done that, then you ought to, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You find power in that word. You find the riches of the spiritual blessings in Christ in that word. And if you've tasted that the Lord is gracious, then you go to Him for continued power and strength and continued blessings in abundance. But we must not make the mistake of turning away from that source, being deceived that there might be power and wealth for spiritual life and blessings in another place or with another person. So with that comes the understanding that in Christ has to do with a spiritual location Ultimately, in the law of Christ, in the gospel of Christ, what He's revealed to us is what we must go to to be in Him and to find that power and wealth. All other doctrine, all other churches, all other people will fail to give us the strength we need to prevail and find victory and therefore will fail to present us with spiritual blessings and treasure. If we make the mistake of turning away from the power and riches of Christ, what we're ultimately doing is turning to weak, not powerful, and beggarly, not abundant in riches elements. These things feign spiritual power and wealth, but you're not going to find any power and wealth in them. The Apostle Paul spent some time in Galatians speaking to that truth because the Galatians, as we're very familiar with, had been presented with a false gospel after Paul had already teach, or taught the true gospel to them. In Galatians chapter 1, he told them that he marvels at the fact that they are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He says it's not another gospel, you're being deceived. Part of that, as we know well in Galatians and throughout the New Testament, was the problem of Judaizing error. In fact, the word Judaize is found in the second chapter of Galatians. When you'll remember well, Paul uses the example of Peter playing the hypocrite and therefore even carrying away Barnabas into his hypocrisy along with many other Christians. He uses that as an example to show the folly and inconsistency in preaching the gospel and then compelling others to live as Jews. And it uses the word eudazo, which is to Judaize, to make a Jew, to compel others to live as Jews. And he'd explain in this epistle in very powerful fashion that it's not inconsequential to turn to the old law again and start keeping it in respect to this idea that you must do so in order to be found just in the sight of God. It's not enough to be in Christ. You've got to be a Jew. You've got to keep circumcision, which really stands as a representation of keeping all the decrees and customs of the law of Moses. And he says in chapter 5, if you do that, you become estranged from Christ. He's not saying if you 
keep a feast day or if you become circumcised in and of itself, you're going to be estranged from Christ. He's saying if you think you've got to do that to be saved, then you've fallen from grace because it's Christ who saves you. And so he's warning about consequences of such in this epistle. But what's extremely interesting about this is that he's not just like we're studying in Hebrews, talking to Jewish Christians who are turning away from Christ back to their old ways. But he's especially addressing Gentiles who have found sonship and adoption in Christ, who have found the power that idolatry lacked, who have found the true God and His true Son and have become true sons of the Creator of the universe. Now they are being persuaded to turn to the old law. That's what we find in Galatians. I want us to focus in on chapter 4 for just a moment before we make some application. In the first seven verses, the Apostle Paul addresses the Galatians and the fear he has for them as they are turning back to the old ways, the ways that proved ineffective to make one a true child of God and to redeem from sins. And he addresses the change and the relation to God from under the old law to being in Christ in respect to this concept of heirship. Ultimately, he argued in chapter 3 that the old law was merely a tutor to bring us to Christ. It was temporary. It was instrumental in salvation, but it did not offer salvation in itself. It brought us to the one who could save us. And you're justified by faith in Him. He ended chapter 3 with saying, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And he explained the way that by faith you are sons of God in Christ Jesus is that you were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. Baptism is essential to salvation. And you were baptized into Christ. And so chapter 4, after he says, if you're sons, then you are heirs according to the promise in chapter 3.29. Chapter 4 continues with that concept of being sons, heirs to an inheritance. And he argues with the vast difference and inferiority of being under the old law as to being in Christ under this new law with this idea of being an heir as a minor and being an heir in the majority or one who has grown and no longer under guardians and stewards. So he explains in verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. And so slaves and servants were often included in the conversation of a household. And he's saying, you're a son, but under the old law, you're no different than a slave because you're under the guardians and stewards. And so a slave is a part of that household but he has no inheritance. Now, you may have an inheritance, but in your minority as a child, you're no different than the slave because you have no right to it at that time. There's a time appointed by the Father where you will come into the possession of that inheritance. And while you're a child, you're no different than a slave. He makes application of that in the next two or three verses. Even so, we, and I think here the we is especially in reference to Jews, but he'll transition to include Gentiles and the Galatians as well. He says, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So he says, when we were children, he's speaking of the time when Jews were without Christ under the old law. They were the people of God, And certainly there was the promise of eternal life, not just to them, but all the nations of the earth will be blessed through the seed of Abraham, that is Jesus, who died on the cross for the sins of all. But as long as you were under the old law, you were no different than a slave. You were under bondage. And I want us to notice what he says there, under bondage to the elements of the world. He'll use that same word in verse 9 when he's talking about what the Gentiles in Galatia are turning back to when they start keeping the old law. The elements of the world is from a Greek word, which means the basic components of something, elements. And it's used in many ways, but in the New Testament, its primary use uh, 
is in reference to the substances underlying the natural world. And so we have the periodic table of elements. To them, it would have been things like earth, fire, wind, and water. These are the elements that make up everything that we see. Physical substance, in other words. Elements of the world. But it also, as it mentions and has to do with basic components of something, oftentimes we're used of those things which constitute the foundation of learning. And I think that there's a duality of the word used here. And I think we see that under the old law. It is physical. There are fleshly ordinances. These can't actually make atonement for sins. These can't actually purify the conscience. They purify the flesh. But all of this is teaching you about Christ. Hebrews 9 and verse 1 speaks about the tabernacle and how it was a divine ordinance but of an earthly sanctuary. And he explained in verse 8 that the Holy Spirit in reference to this tabernacle and its furnishings and its function was indicating something. That the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. It was symbolical. He goes on to say in verse 10, it concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. In, in other words, he's saying, listen, these things in and of themselves had no power to save you. It was just physical, comprised of things that are going to be burned up in the end of time. These things can't save. They taught you where salvation was. They prepared you for the Christ. So he says in verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might have uh, received the adoption as sons. All of these things kept you under bondage because the fulfillment of them is in Christ and you're without Christ, but when He comes, you're redeemed. You're no longer slaves, you're sons, truly. You are receiving the benefit. So he says in verse 6, because you are sons, and I believe that would include also the Gentiles who put on Christ, not just the Jewish Christians. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I think what he's saying here is you have the disposition, the attitude as a son, just like Jesus and you can cry to your Father for help. You can call on Him in a time of need. You can appeal to Him as a son would. But then he addresses specifically these Gentile Christians in Galatia of which this congregation was primarily comprised and points out the irony and the sadness and the fact that they were turning to that law that held the Jews under bondage once before and therefore would hold them under bondage. But there's some interesting nuance to this. He says in verse 8, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those by, which by nature are not gods. He's not talking about the Jews here. He's talking about the Gentiles and idolatry. You didn't know God. And so what did you do? As Romans chapter 1 indicates, you worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. You serve those which by nature are not gods. Those that are made of the elements of the world. Wood, stone, carved and shaped by man's devising. That's where you were because you didn't know God. But notice in verse 9, he says, Now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, that is your sons, so you're part of His family, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements which you desire again to be in bondage? But I want us to notice what he's talking about here. And verse 10, you observe days, months, seasons, and years, and I'm afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. The weak and beggarly elements he's talking about that they're turning to are the customs of the law of Moses. But I want you to notice what he says there. He says, how is it that you turn again? They weren't under the old law previously. And so when he mentions these weak and beggarly elements of chapter 4 and verse 9, and he immediately in verse 10 identifies that with the customs of the law of Moses, but he says you're turning to them again. What he's doing is he's equating the elements of idolatry with the elements of 
of the law of Moses. And I'm not saying that they're equal in all respects. The old law was revealed by Jehovah Himself. The old law is perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19 says. But here's how it's extremely similar to idolatry and those customs, those observations, those feasts, those services, and those temples. It was physical. Without what it pointed to, within its components alone, devoid of the essence of spiritual truth and reality that lies behind them, which they represent, it's no better than idolatry. And he's saying this, you thought you were redeemed from something that couldn't save you, and you were, but now you're turning back to this law that still can't save you. It may appear to be better than idolatry was, but when you reject its object in Christ and you turn back to it for salvation, you're doing the same thing. It's weak, not powerful. It's beggarly. There is destitution under that law. It can't save you. There's no spiritual value back there. And I want you to notice that he says he's surprised by this because now, verse 9, after you have known God, you're doing this. You'll remember in Acts, the seventh chapter, when Stephen was in ending up uh, stoned and, and dead after he had preached the gospel very straightforward to the Jewish Sanhedrin, he had made the point at the end of that because they had lied about how this man preaches Jesus who talked about defiling this holy place, the temple. He ended that with saying, the Most High does not dwell in these temples. He does not have this nature that can be confined to four physical walls. It's the same thing he essentially would say, Paul, that is, in Acts 17 to the Gentiles. He's not made with men's hands as though he's needed anything. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. We ought not think the divine nature is like art or gold or anything shaped by man's devising. He is spirit. And so essentially the Jews and the Gentiles were in the same boat, weren't they? They were viewing spiritual things through the physical lens and they were representing God in physical elements. And he's saying that's weak, that's beggarly. And turning back to the law of Moses is no better than turning back to idolatry. It's no better. He says, I fear lest I have labored for you in vain. So this is what his plea is in verse 12. He says, I urge you, brethren, to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all, he says. Become like me. What does he mean by that? Notice in chapter 2 what Paul said in verse 19. I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Become like me. He says, and this is ironic. I came, I became like you. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when he's talking about how much he loves God and his law and he loves souls that God is trying to save through the law of Christ, he says, because of that, I have become all things to all men. To what extent, Paul? To those who are without law, that is the law of Moses. I have become as one who is without law. He says, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. But he's saying, listen, when I went to the world as a Jew to preach the gospel to Gentiles, I did not bind the law of Moses on them. I did not treat them as if they were to become a Jew in order to be saved as a child of God. He said, I did that to you, Galatians. You remember that? You remember how much benefit you received from that? And now you not only are turning away from the, old law, or from the law of Christ and from Christ Himself, but you're turning away from me, and now you're becoming my enemies just because I tell you the truth, He's going to say, isn't that ironic? I became like you. And now you're acting as though I'm lost because I'm not keeping the old law. He says, become like me again. Forsake that weak and beggarly system. And latch on to the true spiritual substance in Christ. He says in verse 13, Remember how you treated me at the first when I preached to you this good news? He says, you know that because of physical infirmity or through physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. My trial which was in the flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing which you enjoyed? 
Why'd you do that? What did it benefit you? I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Where's that gone from? He says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It's so sad and so ironic, the transition that they made. So he warns them about these false teachers that that may seem to them to be on their side, rooting for them, trying to help them. And he says, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. He says, listen, I was zealous for you because I loved your soul. They're zealous for you because they want the attention. Why did you turn to them and away from the truth whenever I left you? He says, listen, it's good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you. The gospel hasn't changed. Why have you stopped being zealous for it? Here's where I want us to make a contrast. He says, you're turning back to the weak and beggarly elements. You are turning away from the power that could save you and change you to something that is impotent and destitute. He says, my little children in verse 19, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and change my tone for I have doubts about you. He says, I'm trying to form Christ in you. You're turning away from him. What's the hope of glory for the Gentiles? Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, he says. That's power. That's expectation. Where are the riches hidden? The spiritual riches, Ephesians 1.3. They're in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 says... They are hidden in the wisdom and knowledge of God in Christ. You're turning away from the power. You're turning away from the riches. I have my doubts about you. It's all about having Christ formed in you, and you can't do that through the law of Moses. And here's the application, brethren. There are plenty of things out there, plenty of teachings, plenty of people, plenty of institutions, plenty of activities that boast and act as though there's spiritual substance in them, there's spiritual power in them, there's spiritual riches available at that source. But that's Satan lying to you. Because if it's not Christ, it's weak and beggarly. Do not turn to the weak and beggarly elements of the world. Here's a few applications of that. Firstly and foremost, we understand by the very context that it is a mistake to turn to the Old Testament to find authority for anything that we do because it's a weak and beggarly system. We must understand the good use and proper use of the Old Testament today. In Romans 15 and verse 4 it says that those things written before are written for our learning. It's not our authority but they're written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Paul says that these were our examples and written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. He even told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 15 that these things make you wise for salvation. But here's the difference. They're not your authority. They don't have power to save you. They make you wise for salvation, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. We study the Old Testament to find fingers pointing to Christ. We study the Old Testament to see how the holy God that we still serve today interacts with His created people. We study the Old Testament to realize the beginnings of everything we know, but we don't study the Old Testament to find authority for what we're doing in the service of God because it's obsolete. So notice in chapter 5 of Galatians, he says, this is what you do. You become entangled again with the yoke of bondage, verse 1. He says, if you become circumcised, that is, so as to be saved, you will not profit anything from Christ. I testify to you again in verse 3 that every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Are you only keeping circumcision or are you doing everything the old law says? You are indebted to keep the whole law. He says, you have become estranged from Christ if you you attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Why? For we through the Spirit, the revelation of the Spirit, eagerly wait 
for the hope of righteousness by faith. In other words, he's saying, listen, the hope of righteousness, the expectation at the end of righteousness, the hope of glory is through faith, not the old law. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith through love. There are plenty of explanations for how this mistake is made, but here are some major ones. You ever heard the thief on the cross appealed to to suggest that you can be saved without baptism? The thief was never baptized, they'll say. Well, they don't actually know that for sure. But that's even beside the point. He tells Jesus, remember me when, I come into your, when you come into your kingdom. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief wasn't baptized, but you know what? That thief was under the old law, wasn't he? The new law was not yet ratified. In Mark 16, 16, the new law says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so you're trying to find authority for salvation separate and apart from the waters of baptism. And so what do you do? You go to the old law, don't you? That's weak and beggarly. It can't save you. Or when individuals try to argue for the use of instrumental music in the worship of our God today. They did it under the old law. But Ephesians 5.19 tells us to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you're going to find authority for what you're doing now under the new law, in the old law, what you're doing is being estranged from Christ and falling from grace. It's weak and beggarly. But here's another weak and beggarly element that people turn to. Self-imposed religion. There is no religious activity that is beneficial outside of the revealed will of Christ. Someone says, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious because religion somehow has become a bad word in today's day and age. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. But in James 1, it talks about a pure and undefiled religion. The very Bible tells us that there is a pure and undefiled religion. Religion is not a bad thing. It just means rendering obeisance to divinity, to serve and fear God, to do Him service. But religion that is self-imposed, I made it up, no matter how spiritual it may feel or how spiritual it may seem, it is weak and beggarly. James chapter 1 and verse 19 tells us, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He's talking about being swift to hear God's word and slow to speak against it. In James chapter 2 and verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, but he doesn't bridle his own tongue, he deceives his own heart. His religion is useless. If you speak out against the will of God in Christ and say, I know that he said to do it this way, but I want to do it this way, your religion is useless. He says, pure and undefiled religion. Before God the Father is this. In part, visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's plenty of thought and activity by people claiming to be Christians that at first glance or first hearing may seem spiritual or spiritually minded. But if we start vetting it, like we'll talk about in the next hour with our sermon from 1 John 4, if we start vetting, vetting it and realizing that it's not actually of Christ, then it doesn't matter how spiritual it may seem or feel and how convinced those people are who are propagating it. It's weak and it's beggarly. I'll give you an example over in the book of Colossians chapter 2 where he's talking about keeping the old law but also mixed with other concepts that seem very strange. He says in verse 18 of Colossians 2, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding in things which he has not seen or seen, depending on your translation, vainly flesh, uh, puffed up by his fleshly mind. That sounds spiritual, isn't it? He's talking about either worshiping angels or imitating how angels worship. He's talking about asceticism. You're not, you're not, you're not arrogant, but you're humble enough to go without certain things. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? He talks about even keeping festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, but he says this is all from a fleshly mind. Why is it from a fleshly mind? Even though it sounds so spiritual. He's not talking about eating hot dogs and hamburgers and pizzas like we see even today. He's talking about some spiritual context and con con concepts. But it's fleshly. 
because it's not from Christ. He says in verse 19, not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by what every the joints and ligaments grows out, uh, grows with the increase that is from God. Notice he continues this thought. If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, that's the same words used in Galatians chapter 4. Why is though living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations, don't touch or taste or handle? These all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things, notice, indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion and false humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. He's saying if you want to get to heaven, if you want to conquer sin in the flesh, these things won't cut it. Why? Because they're self-imposed religion. They're self-made religion, maybe your translation says. One definition given is idiosyncratic religion. So it's very peculiar to the individual. Have you ever heard of someone saying, my relationship with Jesus is very personal. It may look different than yours. It says that's actually not from God. That won't cut it. And so we're filled with that around us, aren't we? Our friends at work and school, they talk about religion and they talk about being spiritually minded and they talk about Christ in all of these kinds of ways. They talk about rituals and the tradition of their denomination or their family. They talk about the play that's going to be put on that Sunday, maybe around Christmas or Easter. They talk about the praise bands that they love so much. Maybe they talk about having visions and and dreams. They they certainly refer to their creeds and doctrines of men. They they talk about evangelism in a very market-driven way that's crept into the church. We're going to attract people to Christ through a carnival. And it sounds great. It sounds like a spiritual goal. But he says, if it's self-made religion, it's weak and beggarly because it's of the elements of the world. I'll tell you another thing that we need to be on guard about, and that's emotionalism. Not emotions. Emotionalism. Ism manifests that it's a system of living and in this way of spiritual vitality that I get life spiritually or fellowship with God, I grow closer to Him with the heightened sense of emotions. It's one thing to have emotions. It's another thing to suggest that the emotions are substantive. And here's a false syllogism for you. Emotions are created by God. That's true. Someone says, therefore, if I'm emotional about a spiritual experience, then my strong emotions are proof that I have fellowship with God, that I'm drawing near to Him. But that's not how it works. Emotions in and of themselves do not save. They do not have a function in and of themselves. They have a function when they are coming from the information that is true in Christ. You know, in James 2 and verse 19, he says, even the demons believe and they tremble. That's emotions. Strong emotions. But he's saying they're not saved. You remember in Genesis 37 when the brothers of Joseph sold him into slavery and they dipped his tunic in blood and showed it to Jacob, his father. What did he say? He said in Genesis 37 and verse 33, It is my son's tunic, and a wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces, and he mourned for him. That's strong emotions. But verse 36 tells the truth. The Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar. Emotions have a function, but they are not the mechanism to save. And so we got to be on guard about being emotional about a doctrine that's false. But, but how can it feel so good and be wrong? Or even a song that's untrue. Or even a song that's true and I'm emotional, not because I know what the song is teaching, but because the melody is so beautiful. And I believe the melody of songs is meant to incite emotion, but in conjunction with its message. And that's why when we sing about the cross, there may be a sorrowful melody. And when we sing about heaven, there's an upbeat and joyful melody. But the melody itself that incites the emotions is not the thrust of the song, it's the message. Emotions by themselves are weak and beggarly. Something young people need to be on guard about is just getting so emotional in spiritual context, but it's because of the company that you're with. It's weak and beggarly. We need to have faith in the power and riches of Christ. And lastly, empty ritualism. We say, well, that's, that's Old Testament. That's Catholicism. We don't have to worry about that here. It's not true. Because in Ephesians 5.19, for example, when it talks about singing and making melody in your heart, he's saying the instrument is spiritual. It's your mind. It's your inner man. It's your heart. 
But aren't you still using the mechanics of your body? Your vocal cords and your tongue and your lips? Isn't your body still functioning to produce that song that is in your heart, but you're explaining it and showing it in your singing? If you are singing all the words to every song that we just sang, but the melody is not being made in your heart, that's empty ritualism. Singing in and of itself does nothing. It's singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs which have a God-given message and that is in your heart. If that's not the case, that's just empty ritualism. It's no better than any other thing that we've condemned. Or how about the Lord's Supper? In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul talks about what Jesus instituted. It's, a, it's about our heart. We're remembering something very important. So he says in verse 27, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What's the unworthy manner? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. There are too many Christians in the Lord's church who think for some reason that the Lord's Supper is the main feature of worship when it's no more important or less important than singing. It's no more important or less important than giving. It's no more important or less important than preaching. All of those revolve around the cross of Christ. Not just the Lord's Supper, but here's the sad part about it. It's the main thing they'll think. So they'll show up on the 11 o'clock service, but not at the 9 o'clock service. Because the Lord's Supper is served at 11. Or perhaps some congregations who still have this morning and evening service will show up in the morning, but not in the evening. All we've got to do is take the Lord's Supper. Or we've got a lot of plans today, and so we'll take the Lord's Supper and we'll leave before the Word of God is proclaimed. And even some of those will still just eat the bread and drink the fruit of the vine without a thought in their mind about the crucifixion. And he says, if you're doing that, you're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. The bread and fruit of the vine, devoid of what they represent, being in your mind and heart while you're observing the memorial, is merely weak and beggarly elements. No different than eating a sandwich and drinking Welch's is it when someone partakes of the Lord's Supper without a thought in their heart about Christ? That's empty ritualism. He says, listen, don't get caught up in the weak and beggarly elements. The substance and the riches and the power is in the message of the cross. We can be guilty of this just like the Galatians were. So we need to be on guard for it. I want to tell you, if your faith, your religion your spiritual practices and activity is reduced down to the elements of the world, then you don't know how deprived you are spiritually. Come and find the power and wealth in Christ and make sure you stay there. Before we dismiss to our classes, we're going to be led in a word of closing prayer.